Well, good morning, everyone here in person, and good morning, afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us online. Welcome. Uh, I'm Don Gresset. I am the director of the UNDP, UN Development Programs Representation Office here in Washington, D.C., and it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you to what I'm sure is going to be a very lively, but I think more importantly, uh, informative uh, panel discussion as part of our official side event to the Nobel Prize Summit, which has been taking place here this week in Washington, D.C. So first, I'd like to start with a few thank yous, uh, primarily to Pedro Conceição, who has agreed to be our esteemed moderator for the discussion today. Uh, Pedro is the head of the uh, Human Development Report Office uh, for UNDP. Also, a special thanks to Neve Hannafin. Uh, Neve uh, was critical in putting this together. And Neve is a senior advisor in our Oslo Governance Center. And also a thanks to Noella Richard, who is our team lead for youth engagement. And also many thanks to others across UNDP who not only organized this event, but more importantly, uh, UNDP's robust, informative, and important participation uh, in the Nobel Prize Summit uh, throughout the week. So the topic of conversation today, uh, information pollution, disinformation, misinformation, it, could, could, it couldn't be more important or more timely. So it impacts all of us every day, whether it's decision making, policy making, it even impacts our relationships with our friends and our families. There's also, of course, societal impacts. There's a detrimental impact on democracy, on development, on democratic processes. They're all under threat, and particularly so in countries that are facing crisis and fragility. Is this phenomenon new? No, well, of course not. It's been around for generations. Uh, centuries we've been dealing as a society with disinformation. But as you know, over the course of just the last few years, developments in innovation and technology have allowed for the exponential increase in both the speed and the breadth of the dissemination of bad information. So who, who has to deal with this uh, in the coming years? Who's going to be impacted the most? Most of you joining us here in the room and all of you online, especially our panelists, is the youth of the world. You are not only the overwhelming users of social media, but you're the ones that are going to have to be grappling with this issue for the decades to come for both the good and the bad. So that's why we wanted to have this official side event to the Nobel Prize Summit um, to hear from you, our youth leaders. We want you to crowdsource, brainstorm, discuss, and debate how best to harness this technology innovation, not only to stop the spread or at least reduce the spread of disinformation, but also how do we harness it to actually make the world a better place, to actually do good. And we're gonna focus our discussion here today on the Global South. So to do this, we're gonna have two, two sets of panels that are gonna be moderated by Pedro. Um, I'll introduce everybody in just a moment, but it'll be very brief and note that as the panelists speak, we're going to be posting their bios uh, on the chat so you can see a little bit more about it. And also apologies in advance if I happen to terribly mispronounce anyone's name. Uh, so our first panel will consist of Santosh Sigdel from the Nepal, Alison Ramirez from Peru, uh, Lu uh, Luisa Franco Machado from Brazil, Dixon Matulula from Zambia, Wayne Jeffrey from South Sudan. Uh, and our second panel consists of Dami Al Nasser from Jordan, Giselle Balazny, who was actually joining us here in person next to me, uh, from Honduras, uh, Maria Kritevska Taseva from North Macedonia, so from North Macedonia, and finally Zawad Alam from Bangladesh. So thanks to all of our panel youth panelists for joining us, for our in-person participants here today. And all of you, I guess there's over 300 uh, registrants uh, joining us uh, online today. So now over to you, Pedro, to start the, the discussion. Thank you, Don. And let me start also with a thank you to you and to the wonderful uh, Washington office, to all the support uh, to our participation, UNDP's participation in the Nobel Prize Summit, and particularly in organizing and hosting uh, this event. 
So I wanted to start by putting some numbers behind the points that uh, Don just made about the extent to which there is lack of agreement in our societies about basic facts. Uh, some evidence from uh, the Pew Research Center uh, for high-income countries said that uh, more than half of the population in high-income countries today does not agree on basic facts. Not agree on basic facts. So I think it's important to draw a distinction between these agreements that people may have uh, on policies, on actions, on views, and the lack of agreement that exists on, on, on basic facts. In fact, I would say that it's important and useful in our societies to have diversity of views and facts, particularly in a context of uncertainty in which we need innovation and we cannot get uh, to innovation if everyone thinks alike. So I think the challenge that we are confronting here is very specific in that uh, it's not new necessarily, but we have an extent of disagreement on a shared understanding what what are the basic facts uh, that stands in a way of uh, public reasoning and uh, in the way of uh, enabling us to to get to collective action and, and this has been the focus of the the Nobel summit over the last three days um, and I think that uh, in my view it implies looking both at the demand side so why do people come to hold uh, these very dis disparate beliefs about what the truth is as well as to the supply side. How is information being conveyed to people um, by media and by other agents uh, that uh, leads to this uh, divergence and these very sharp cleavages about what uh, are basic facts. Um, and as Don said, technology has been uh, affecting both the supply and the demand side and the way in which they, they interact. And in many instances, exacerbating uh, the challenges that we currently confront. But I think it's important to put the emphasis on the fact that the, it's, how, it's how the technology is used because the technology in itself is not necessarily the culprit. It's what we do with it. Uh, and this notion that it's about what we do with it is central to the, to the idea of, of human development. Uh, and that's why in our human development reports, we've been uh, looking, trying to look both at the processes that lead societies to come together or fail to come together as a result of lack of trust and political polarization, um, as well as how the digital context shapes the way in which uh, people do or fail to uh, come together to address uh, shared challenges. So this is uh, what we're going to be focusing on um, today. And we'll have um, two sessions, as, as Don said. So the first session is going to focus uh, more on um, understanding the extent to which uh, this is a problem uh, in low and middle income countries. Uh, remember, the data that I mentioned is for high income countries. So we have lots of evidence about what's happening in high income countries, but not as much uh, information um, uh, uh, about what's happening in low and middle income countries. So we're going to hear for, from uh, uh, colleagues that are going to share with us the extent to which this is becoming a problem, also uh, in context other than the ones uh, that take place in high income countries, and how that, that is affecting life, possibilities, discussions uh, in, uh, in those contexts. Uh, and then in the second session, we're going to move um, towards perhaps the most important question, which is, so what, we, what do we do about it? So we know that we have a problem. But what do we do about it? Uh, our administrator, Achim Steiner, always tells me, don't, don't tell me I have, a, I have a problem. I know I have a problem. Tell me, what do we do about it? So this is uh, what's going to be the focus of the, of the second session. And, and here I just want to, to say that uh, in addition to looking at the concrete solutions, if you want to use that expression, that are going to be expressed, we have to recognize that the solutions will always be context specific. Um, uh, so it's important to look at the solutions as such, but the most important takeaway, in my view, of being confronted with these solutions is that we are not powerless uh, as we confront these challenges and we can do something about it. And it goes back to this idea of human agency that is the one, again, central to the idea of, of human development. So um, let's move on to the, to the first session. As Don said, we are here to listen, <laughs> first of all. 
uh, and I'll be trying to uh, not speak uh, too much. Uh, I'll be uh, moderating. Uh, and uh, my role as a moderator is, uh, first of all, to invite um, uh, uh, Santos to begin with, to share um, uh, perspectives from uh, Nepal. So, Santos, over to you. You need to unmute yourself there. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, this is Santosh Sikdal from Nepal. Uh, I'm a co-founder and executive director of Digital Rights Nepal. And you have set the tone of the meeting, how this problem is uh, same for everywhere, but there are contexts and there are uh, specific local context, which is important. And uh, for the lower middle countries, there might be some trends about how it has impacted the society. Talking about Nepal, uh, well, the digitization process has accelerated in the last few years. The internet penetration, people's access to internet has increased, and so is the access to information. However, uh, there is a uh, new users who are there in the digital arena without having the necessary skill or knowledge or digital literacy to navigate the space. And with the proliferation of users and the uh, access, penetration of access, the, the level of uh, misinformation, disinformation has also increased. And we, if we track the kind of impact the technology or the flow of information, access to information has, uh, well, if we track that, we see that uh, there are kind of level where it has made impact on various level in society. It has, because Nepal is a multilingual and multiracial country, a, if there are hundreds of caste groups, uh, and there is a uh, ethnic groups with a different language. There is a multiple religion. So somehow it has also in the local level, it uh, the level of uh, misinformation, disinformation at times has uh, made impact on the social division. Also, it has. Uh, we have seen that in some cases. Similarly, we, I think the. The level of uh, the misinformation, disinformation uh, also has uh, somehow impact on the political instability also. And we have seen that uh, the, uh, the flow of information, misinformation, especially disinformation regarding the particular project or the uh, development assistance uh, at one time has uh, ripped the society into two. There was a clear polarization uh, over the uh, over the development issues and the development priorities, whether that should be Nepal should uh, take certain poly, uh, certain development assistance or not. So at that time, we we had been digital rights. Nepal had been monitoring social media as well as uh, the kind of trend in the social media, and it had made impact on the people's level. And it was the lack of digital literacy that many of the uh, the content with the disinformation was being shared very widely and people had started believing that. So that is another, uh, another instance whether how the, uh, uh, the false misleading or manipulated content has made impact in the society. And COVID was a kind of big example where uh, the disinformation and misinformation had made impact on people with uh, where the disinformation pieces or the news, uh, they were circling in social media, people were believing on that, they were, uh, the medical practices that were people were sp spreading around. So that was another kind of impact I see a, as a trend in the uh, developing countries. And it might, it might be the kind of trend in uh, uh, other countries as well. And the, another kind of trend we have seen is that the, the impact uh, this uh, misinformation, disinformation has is people, it impact on the uh, trust of people on the uh, uh, on the issue in the institution, be it the public institution like courts or the legislature or the member of the parliament, 
uh, if the level of impact is, uh, if the uh, penetration of the disinformation, misinformation very high, they will lack the trust in the institution. And we have seen that uh, trend. So overall it is uh, uh, the social division or the political instability uh, and the trust of institution, because that is also, because we recently had the election, we have also seen the trend during the election. So political party, it also impact the functioning democracy through the mistrust over the political process as well. So that is going to have the impact on the democratic processes that you said earlier. So these are the major trends we have seen uh, in terms of Nepal, Pedro. Thank you so much, um, Santosh. So I think I wanted to emphasize the last point you made about the erosion of trust in institutions and processes. So it's not only that uh, democrat that um, groups are polarized, but there's this actually this more insidious uh, impact in uh, uh, eroding the trust in, in fundamental institutions and processes. So let's move now to Alison Ramirez in Peru. Alison, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I heard Santosh and I recognize many things that he said because uh, many phenomena that uh, he mentioned are uh, happening in Peru, like uh, social division, uh, political stability, uh, the erosion of trust in institutions. So I want to emphasize why what we found with uh, our project in Monitor Plus here in Peru. And in Monitor Plus, uh, as you know, is a platform with uh, artificial intelligence, who, which uh, capture publications in social media uh, that contains uh, hate speech and gender-based violence. So uh, I want to emphasize three points that we found uh, with, with, with our project is that first, uh, the socially vulnerable population is also targeted more often and more viciously online. Uh, in our first special report following the attempted cup by the ex-president Pedro Castillo, we identify how the term terrorist was used against the regional, rural, and indigenous populations in social media in relation to people who were mobilizing against the government. Uh, second, we see a sustained attack against efforts of mediation. I think a very clear example of this is the attempt to delegitimize the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, these institutions made a report of this last period of violence and repression in protest. Uh, in this regard, a lot of misinformation and hate speech were spread against the, this organization. Because uh, we think as polarizing voices gain ground mediating actors are demissed or delegitimized. Uh, my final point that I want to emphasize too is that we see a worrying trend of degradation of freedom of expression, especially against journalists who are systematically harassed on social media for speaking out or investigating uh, human rights violations. No, uh, um, Practically to uh, they are receiving harassing for doing their work, right? And this type of violence is gendered because we found that female uh, journalists are the main victims. And I think this is a, a problem that we, we have to, to see uh, closer. And this is the things that I, I have to, I wanted to, to, to emphasize for that our findings uh, with our project in Monitor Plus. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, I think your second point is, is particularly relevant because um, we know that it's important uh, for human societies to have uh, processes of, of, of um, mm -hmm. bonding. So we bond uh, amongst people that share a similar set of beliefs, but it's important also to have processes of bridging people that have uh, different views. And what you said in your first point is that these processes of bridging, for instance, mediation, 
are also themselves being eroded and then these uh, uh, accentuates or accelerates even political polarization. Um, so let's go to uh, Luisa now in Brazil, not too far from uh, Peru, at least geographically. Luisa, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's amazing to be here. So thanks a lot for the invitation. So just presenting myself very briefly. My name is Luisa Franco Machado. I'm a Brazilian feminist, social scientist living in Berlin, in Germany, although I'm currently in Mexico. Um, and I have been recognized by the UN as a young leader for the Sustainable Development Goals. And that has been as a result of my research and activism um, for digital rights and data justice. I am also a data economy advisor at the German International Development Cooperation Agency, GIZ. Um, but as a good political scientist, I really want to dedicate, uh, dedicate this really short intervention to really shine a light on some crucial but maybe misunderstood topics that we have seen in the digital age regarding information integrity. So let's just dive right in. I think at this point, most of us already know the different ways in which you know, digital technologies have been impacting decision-making and information integrity. We have seen countries and organizations worldwide calling for this so-called you know, data revolution, digital revolution. But we really have seen that this revolution doesn't address everyone equally. We really have seen that you know, minorities are on the edge and actually already having their own personal data exploited on a regular basis, and then having this information potentially used against them. So, you know, we see a burning risk of surveillance, you know, concerns over data privacy, the negative consequences of algorithmic biases. And, you know, this impacts our society in so many different ways. But, okay, since we already know how, maybe the question that we should be asking ourselves is why? Why do we see this growing need or this growing interest in, you know, pushing for misinformation and disinformation? Well, the likelihood of being impacted by breaches on information integrity is really magnified depending on existing socioeconomic conditions, right? So in the global South, we see really the emergence of, and I think already the stabilization of what we call the digital subalterns, which if I can you know, give a very brief definition, is a new class of datafied subjects that they are then kept outside of the political and the symbolic order. So I spent several years researching the use of digital technologies and social media in electoral campaigns in Latin America. So my first campaign was in 2018 in Brazil, so five years ago. And if I go, can go back to this question on why we have seen this boom in purposely false, misleading and manipulated information, I can safely tell you it's narrative control. So if you'd keep anything from my intervention, that would be it, narrative control. So who's controlling the narrative that we see every day? How and why? And of course, who's benefiting from that, right? It's, it's long gone that the idea of disinformation as something caused by mistake or by uneducated people, right? As we hear in the global North-led narratives. Actually, those who feed this network are actually professional content producers. We see members of these groups even orchestrating collective attacks and threatening those who, goes, who go against that. And then this doesn't end there. This all have a real impact in public policy. So to just you know, finish it up with a practical example, because I, I can understand why this kind of seems something that might be just so hard to imagine because it's just so crazy, but it's actually happening every day in most of our societies. So in Brazil, for example, we honestly have seen something that we could have seen and probably will see, unfortunately, all over the world. So this month, we have set to vote on a bill fighting, uh, on a bill fighting fake news, fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. So that's great, right? So who would be against that? Well, big tech. 
Just like they have lobbied in Europe against the Digital Services Act, the DSA, and the Digital Markets Act, the DMA, um, we have seen the same companies using the same arguments in our own backyard in Latin America. So we have seen these companies radically against this type of regulation because it holds them accountable for not taking steps to curb misinformation and disinformation. And what happened? Well, these companies have then started sharing misinformation against this bill on their own platforms. So for example, Google put on their starting page a link against this bill and allegedly even manipulated the search results, prioritizing links against the bill. Um, so what do we do when the companies themselves who were supposed to be accountable for this information then leverage their own platforms to share fake news? right? I think this is something we don't think about a lot, but I'll leave it as an open question and maybe perhaps our colleagues in the next session, um, they can help us answer that. So thank you so much for the invitation and looking forward to hearing everyone else. Thank you, Luis. Indeed, our colleagues in the next session are going to tell us all about what to do, so don't worry about it. We'll come out of this session with all the answers about the problems that we're confronting. I just wanted to emphasize the point you made about narratives, because it's something that is no news for political scientists and other social scientists. But I wanted to uh, share that it's even been recognized within economics, for instance, which is a discipline that traditionally downplays the importance of uh, the narratives and how they shape not only political behavior, but also economic behavior. In fact, there's an economist, Bob Schiller, uh, who won the Nobel Prize that wrote a book called Narrative Economics to explain how these narratives actually shape also economic outcomes. Uh, right, so I think we are not doing that well on time, so we have to rush along. And now we move to Dixon in Zambia. Dixon, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dixon Matula from Catholic Leadership Services in Zambia. Zambia is in southern Africa, southern part of Africa. I'm project manager for a youth focused climate action, a project called Youth Climate Champions. And uh, once again, thanks a lot for the opportunity to be part of the panel discussion. Uh, if you can allow me just to give a bit of a background on our project, because most of my submissions will be centered around uh, climate action. So our, our project is called Youth Climate Champions. It's youth led uh, action and is funded by uh, UNDP Zambia working with other partners. We are working mostly with youths uh, between the ages of 30, 18 and 30, both in rural and uh, urban parts of the country. So our, our project goes to contribute to the government of Zambia goal of reducing effects and impacts of climate change through uh, youth-led actions. The project has been in place uh, for the last 11 months. We started uh, operations in June, 2022, and we are working with 56 youths so far. Uh, these are gender balanced youths, uh, six, 56 out of school youths and the 90 secondary school pupils in three districts with an aim of attaining climate change resilience for at least 2,000 households by 2024. So our main focus is on climate change mitigation awareness, uh, creation, as well as uh, combating deforestation. In our context, deforestation is a key, key driver of uh, climate change. I, I know in other parts of the world, uh, the, the drivers may be different. Uh, so we also do a bit of focusing on adaptation activities, mostly uh, climate smart agriculture sensitization for local farmers. So in the last 12 months, we've reached out to about 1,241 households with climate uh, action messaging. So once again, uh, we're very grateful with the support from UNDP. We've been able to do a, a number of things because of their support. Getting to misinformation and uh, climate change, uh, what I would say that in the context of climate change, misinformation refers to, to deceptive or misleading content that misrepresents scientific data in order to erode trust in climate science, erode trust in climate experts, as well as the uh, scientific solutions that are being offered for climate change. So climate misinformation is also aimed at undermining uh, the existence of impacts of climate change and the unequivocal human influence on uh, the climate uh, change has brought. Let me also mention that in our context, misinformation, that is in the sub-Saharan Africa, where Zambia is, misinformation is a growing problem However, uh, we also have a bigger challenge of just access to information itself beyond the misinformation. Access to information is still a challenge in our part of the world, whether it's access to credible, accurate information or misinformation itself. For example, on average in Africa, we have 
only about 22% of the population having access to internet technology. And in this era, I think most of the information that people get is through the internet. So access is average is 22%. For Zambia itself is about 20%. Uh, we, it, they, they, uh, they, it varies country by country. For example, Morocco has it 4% access, while other countries like Niger is as low as 14%. So the situation is actually more severe in rural areas where very few people have access to accurate information. Maybe I can also briefly talk about some of the major drivers of misinformation in our, in our area. Uh, one of them is a limited access to credible sources of information, then also propaganda, especially through social media. The commonest social media outlets here is uh, WhatsApp and Facebook. So we see a lot of propaganda information being spread out. For example, propaganda information about climate change and uh, that is bringing a lot of polarization it's, and it's discouraging a lot of action in terms of climate action. Another example would be, we, we, we're just coming out of the COVID pandemic. We saw a lot of uh, propaganda misinformation on the existence or non-existence of uh, the, the, the COVID infection that was driving a lot of people not to get vaccinated. Then thirdly, the other uh, source of misinformation now set up is a long held myths uh, that have been passed on from one generation to the other mostly for the fact that people don't have access to good sources of information, they would resort to other sources of knowledge like traditional beliefs as well as uh, religious beliefs. So the young people, I believe, have a big role, an important role to play in countering the false and misleading uh, uh, content that comes through uh, misinformation. Uh, for example, young people are key information dissemination. And uh, in Africa, young people make up a, a, a very huge part of our population. For example, youth under 25 years of age represent 60% of the population in Africa, according to an AU report for 2021. And in my country, Zambia, 70% of the population are under the age of 30, with those between 15 and 25 years making up up to 6% of the population. So young people have the energy and uh, the enthusiasm to bring about the required change in their community. Then young people are also a bridge between the young and the old. So I feel they have a very good uh, role to play in terms of uh, demystifying this misinformation that is uh, going around. Then uh, the other reason why a few young people can drive this uh, agenda of, of, of doing away with misinformation that uh, young people are more open to change and uh, when we're equipped with the right skills, they can spread the correct information and support the increase in knowledge and ultimate behavior change amongst their peers, families, as well as uh, communities. Okay, uh, further, um, we also have some gaps. Uh, I don't know how much time I'm given. We also have some gaps in terms of uh, information. We're wrapping up, please. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a few gaps that we have in terms of uh, information access in our in our settings. Uh, some of, like I indicated, the, the other one, the first one is access to information itself. And uh, also, maybe because of time, I'll also talk about the, some of the things that we are trying to do. To, cut, to, cut, I mean, to combat this mis misinformation as a project, at project level, we, we've tried to use an approach where we are working mostly at community level to try and, and reach out directly to the households and the community to provide them the correct information on, uh, on climate change using the 56 youths and the pupils. So one of the means we are using is the establishing of uh, information centers in the communities where the youths meet and they have TV sets, they have brochures, and people come there to access the correct information. We also have got WhatsApp groups where we try to disseminate uh, correct information about uh, climate change. Then we also use pupils in schools. Pupils are the future leaders and in schools, when they have the correct information, they also take the correct information to their parents at, at, at home as they go back from uh, school. Then one other important thing we've done is literacy levels are quite high. So we try to, to put some of that information, correct information in the local language. Because as language is translated, some of the, the, the meaning may be lost. So those are some of the things in a nutshell that we've done so far to try and uh, combat this misinformation problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dixon. So I, I think one of the important points you made is uh, related to the to the lack of access to to the internet and i think this the importance of this lack of access was heightened during the context of the covid 19 pandemic when many schools uh, around the world were, were closed and in high income countries people had the option of uh, continuing to learn online but 
uh, in countries like Zambia and many others, this was curtailed by the lack of access to the internet. Um, uh, in addition, I would also mention that not having access to the internet does not mean that people are not vulnerable to misinformation. Uh, broadcast radio, for instance, has been a tool that has been widely used also to uh, disseminate misinformation. Uh, so the last uh, uh, speaker in this first session is uh, Wani uh, in South Sudan. Wani, over to you. Uh, so, uh, hello, guys. Uh, hello, Pedro. Thanks so much. Uh, this one is Geoffrey from South Sudan. I'm a, I'm a software developer. Uh, I develop mobile applications, and then I develop an application called Alert Me application that is currently used by the government of South Sudan. That is the, uh, the Commission for Peace and Reconciliation Building. I might be sorry with my network because I'm actually out in the field, out of the capital Juba. I'm in a remote area called Pibor, so that could be really a problem. Also, if you don't hear me properly, uh, it might be a cause to all of us. But I'm really so happy to be invited to, to this summit of today and then uh, to talk about the case of South Sudan. When you look at South Sudan, um, in, the, in terms of information and information pollution and the misinformation, you think we all look into one thing. And that mostly part of South Sudan, we look at, uh, we ha are having like the linguistic diversity that we have in our country. You find we have a lot of uh, uh, dialect that we have. So which means people can communicate in their own dialects and then they share wrong information. People understand them in a wrong way. And this becomes a problem to the community. And then also the access to uh, to media uh, information is also hard as uh, as as in, in remote areas with poor infrastructures, it becomes very hard for them to uh, get information. And then at the end of the day, the broadcast like radio, the broadcast systems becomes giving out wrong information which people cannot verify properly and lack, of, and sometimes also we lack limited access to reliable sources. When I talk about reliable sources, I'm talking about sources that gives correct information. Uh, we as a country in South Sudan, we are uh, weak from a uh, conflict. We have, uh, we are prone to conflicts in, uh, in most of the, uh, the cases, we look at 2013, 2016. This also caused uh, a lot of problem to our country. And then you find information as they've been shared to people, there becomes very hard uh, information. And then the, then the pollution of information is always there like uh, in every part of the country. So we came up with an application that is called Alert Me. So Alert Me generally works in, in incidents. When we talk of incidents, we are talking about conflict incidents. You find people are being reporting like wrong information information about conflicts, about revenge killings, about sometimes abuses, sexual harassments, uh, like GBV cases. You find people reporting them wrongly. So how do we come up? We came, how do we come up with our alert me? UNDP, uh, South Sudan came up with, uh, with a challenge to the youth of South Sudan. How can they come and break up, break down the cause? How can they like bring up this gap of misinformation in the incident reporting uh, with all these and the early warning response of this information in the country. So we came up with uh, the application is a mobile based application called Alert Me. So what it does is we use the local government because in the local areas, we have the local government with a, with a system that works in place. So we use the system that they have. What system do they have? They have the, the, the county, we have the, the Payam, the bombers. So we go to them, we train them on how to disseminate information that is correct to the people. So they send share this information through uh, the application that is allowed me. And when they share this information, we have fact checking. We do fact checking of the information that comes in through the application that verifies that the information that is coming is correct. That the information that comes is correct to, uh, to be used by the organizations, by the government to foster security, to foster, uh, to cut, cut down uh, GBV violences that are happening in the remote locations, in the remote areas of the country. Now also when we look at the polit political manipulation, in South Sudan, we find the ethnic groups are always taken up by the, the politicians. The politicians still take to control their people. So they provide information that they can hate the other uh, community 
So when this comes, we find that the other community, they have problem with the other community and that the community has problem with the other community. And when all this happens, then at the end of the day, you find the wrong information are flowing and then hatreds come in. As, as hatreds come in, then violence automatically comes in. So we try to, to cap down this through our application, our mobile application in a way that um, when this information comes in, we try to fact check the information that comes in through our system. So when you, uh, when you look at that, with all the problems that comes in, what do, have we put in place? We've always tried to make sure that we put like literacy development centers, like we train people on information of misinformation, on health information, on information that can help them. What are the correct information that people have to use in the communities? So as we go with this, we build into policies with the United Development uh, Program in South Sudan. We try to build in policies as we're working also with the government of South Sudan, which is uh, the Peace and Constitution Commission. So this helps us to make sure that we can put in place important uh, aspects of information in each and every project that is happening in Uganda, I mean, in South Sudan. So as we build all these, we, these aspects that we put in, these small, small aspects that we add into uh, this, it helps us cap down the misinformation gap that we have in the country. So generally, the allied, uh, in the post, uh, let me give an example uh, in a scenario that happens in the country. Uh, in 20, uh, last year, 2020, we had an incident that was reported in, uh, in, in some part of the country. So the information came in that over 500 people were raped in one day. So how do you verify and how can like rape happen like 500 people in one day? This cannot be correct. So what we were tasked to, to verify the information that came in and to come to the conclusion, we found out that, yeah, it's true. Of course, these things happen, but no one will believe this if you don't fact check, if you don't verify the information that comes in. It through application. So that's why Alatmi is actually becoming uh, the most like a reliable source of getting information, like true information and correct information, be it health information, incident reporting, as we focus mostly on incidents, because incidents can cause violence in the communities. So when this comes, so we always find uh, this challenge that comes in as we foster all these, we write and that we are bringing technology to, for peace building. That's why we bring these technologies to help us uh, like fasten our process of fact checking using our application, which has more of AI into it that runs a lot of like AI, like fact checking uh, information that comes in most to, through our research, research through the universities that we have around the University of Juba, the Apanel University. We work with them so that we can verify and fact check this information at the end of, of the day. So this is just like the brief information of what we do uh, with a lot of application. Uh, in case of any other thing that will be needed in, in, in future, please, we shall be uh, able to, I'm really so sorry with our internet or maybe our internet and the location where I am is really so so hard, but I really am, I appreciate so much that I'm here today with you people to present on what we are doing in the ground. And as, as, as for now, even we are training people on the fact checking and the misinformation in Pibor County in, uh, in the north part of the country. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, Ani. Now we heard you very, very clearly. Thank you for joining us from the field. Um, I think we moving straight into the next uh, session in part because of uh, difficulties with time. We have only half an hour to go. So with apologies to the other participants, we'll have some time at the end for a discussion. Uh, I wanted to emphasize something that Wani said that I think is very important. Sometimes conflict is described as communities having grievances amongst each other. But often this is actually manipulated and exacerbated by political leaders that rely on misinformation often to exacerbate these tensions that can in the end lead to, to conflict. Um, but uh, one also showed that it's possible to rely actually on technology to correct some information. So in a way, it's already uh, making a bridge to, to the solutions. So let's uh, move straight to the to the second session, continuing with the focus on solutions. Uh, and let me first invite uh, Dania to tell her uh, to tell us uh, of her experience in Jordan. Dania, over to you. Hi everybody, how are you? My name is Dania. I'm from in Jordan. I think as young, what we share are some various and pro problems.
Go ahead, Dania. We can hear yes, you. Well. You can hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Through my work with Jordanian youth over the past few years, I have observed that the most prominent problems facing Jordanian youth particularly with their reliance on social media to obtain and exchange information among themselves is the phenomenon of shadded and false information, which is widely circulated and treated as absolute truth. Furthermore, this information causes an increase in the phenomenon of the spread of the hate speech among Jordanian youth. And because this phenomenon has become too pervasive among Jordanian youth, we should to establish a social youth initiative to shed light on youth problems, specifically fake and shady news, and work to prevent their spread through writing publications and designing infographics in order to address young people in a manner. This characterized by brevity, clarity, and speed, as well as conducting specialized research on brevity of issues. During the early, of, early period of the, the spread of the corona pandemic, there was an increase in the amount of false and misleading information, particularly about the nature and quality of the virus as well as the treatments and vaccines used for its treatment. This phenomenon was global, but the Jordanian youth was affected by these rumors and worked to promote them intentionally or unintentionally on social media pages. During that time, the lack of character, character, critical thinking and rational analysis of information and idea was not not noticeable, as well as the reliance on the transfer of information without reference to its original source. The most important lessons we should have learned was how to quickly refer the right, the right source of a news and convey the right news in an articulative from the energies young people to interact with the and spread it. The Jordanian in figures program, which is supported or offers as Jordanian youth by enhancing our capabilities and empowering young people to better addresses, challenges and issues of interest through the media and social communication was also utilized additionally. It enabled us to communicate and interact with the decision markers. It also throw us how to search for and analyze information from a gender or social perspective or the context of impact of these issues on people with this blush as well as how to engage them the fight agents, false and misleading information. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. I, I think one of the implications of what you shared with us that might have uh, something practical um, uh, or an implication that is practical is, is thinking about education because you mentioned the importance of critical thinking. Um, and often perhaps we think of education as uh, an effort to give facts uh, and prepare people to be productive in the, in, in the economy. And of course that, that is important, but in this context, it's also important to give um, people the skills to think critically about information and to subject uh, beliefs that people may have to, to critical analysis. So that might be perhaps a, a practical implication of what we shared with us. Uh, so now we're going to move to Giselle, who's joining us here in Washington, DC. Thank you for being here in person, Giselle, uh, that is joining us from Honduras. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet everyone in, in person and, and virtually. My name is Giselle Wolosny. I'm from Honduras. And a lot of the work that I've done over the past few years has been based on youth empowerment and not only giving young Hondurans a voice, but amplifying their voices. We truly believe that the Honduran youth has something to say, but there are a lack of channels and platforms for them to raise their voices 
and I'll not only raise their voices, but make them be heard and actually become part of the political agenda in our country. And one of the lessons that we've learned is that in Honduras, we are a developing country as a lot of Latin American countries. And one of the problems, but also it gives us a very nice solution is the fact that there is lack of information and channels that are reliable for people who live specifically in rural areas. And what this means is that people living in rural areas, which is the majority of our population, don't really have access to reliable news outlets and technology. And that means that their reliable channels, most of the time, are their peers, their families, their teachers, and that also leaves a lot of space for misinformation and disinformation. However, it gives us the opportunity to create communities. And that is one of the topics that was discussed in the Nobel Prize Summit. How can we humanize our differences? How can we make solutions that are not one size fits all? And that is one of the other lessons that we've learned through youth work and youth empowerment is that a mistake that is often made by policymakers and adults is to close youth into one group. And that is a mistake because even in Honduran youth, let alone youth around the world, there are so many different realities, so many different groups, whether that is the LGBTQI plus community or in Latin American countries, indigenous groups who are a big part of our culture. One solution does not fit all. And through all the work that we've done with youth and Hondurans around our country, but also internationally, is that we've learned that youth initiatives really <clears throat> look for non-conventional methods to present information. And what I mean by non-conventional methods is using creativity, thinking outside the box to get our points across. And an example of this is the creation of memes using celebrities, using TikTok trends and audios to get our point across. And that just really showcases the creativity in youth, but also their purpose to get their voice be heard by policymakers or other social leaders. And also another point that I think is very important to, to mention is that through all of this work, understanding who your audience is, is very important. So the way that I will present the information that is oriented to a young 20 year old is not the same way that I will present it to my father who's almost 50. And that is also a very important um, point for misinformation because sometimes it gets lost in translation through generations. The way that I want to read the news is not the same way that an adult wants to read the news. And that ties to the point that I was saying in using non-conventional methods to get your point across. And one of the, to wrap it up, I think, recommendations that we would give to policymakers or other influential leaders is to change the narrative. One of the quotes or sayings that we hear the most as young adults is, we want to give you a voice. But as I said earlier, the voice is already there. What young people want is for their voice to be heard and also taken into consideration. So I think, first of all, changing the narrative and changing that quote that is often heard, and also learning that one size does not fit all. And it is very important for youth to be included in the conversation and be part of the table, but not just one young adult but also try to present and represent, I mean, different realities and, and different contexts so that the solutions that we implement are as diverse as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. I think what you said about nar both narratives and diversity is, is so important and it's often missed out. And you're also very right when it comes to voice is not enough. Often when we organize events, we have uh, youth representatives to speak. And often what, what I hear is what you just expressed, is that don't, don't just give us a place to, to speak at, at, the, at an event. Make sure that our thinking and our views are meaningfully represented in, in the decisions that are taken. 
very good. So now we're going uh, back to our virtual room and to Maria, uh, who is joining us from uh, North Macedonia. Skopje, I believe. Maria, over to you. Yes, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. Uh, joining currently from Portugal, but uh, yes, I am from North Macedonia, uh, which is a very small country in the Balkans, but you might have heard about it, uh, especially in relation to this topic of fake news. Uh, back in 2016, you might have heard about a city called Veles uh, that became known uh, as the fake news capital uh, and gained international attention due to its involvement in the spread of fake news during the US presidential uh, elections. Uh, and not only this case, unfortunately, I can say that we are constantly um, being faced with uh, created and shared um, misinformation, disinformation, uh, but I would not focus on the problems uh, in this moment because we already, uh, the previous panelists talked a lot about it. Um, I can just say that I completely support the recommendations that the Giselle uh, gave, so I just not to be repetitive, I would like to uh, rather focus more on some practices that I would like to share from uh, from my country. Um, first, from my um, recent experience on working on the development of the national uh, youth strategy uh, for the next for the period of the next five years, I was working in the area of youth informing, and I can say that I see um, more and more young people showing uh, coming aware actually of the urgent need uh, to learn how to fight this information. Uh, one of the strategic goals that we set in the national youth strategy is actually a young people to be equipped with uh, knowledge and skills for media and digital literacy uh, and to recognize misinformation and articulate as their own interests and views as active citizens in society with developed critical awareness, which was also touched upon from one of the panelists before. Um, of course, that it's not enough just to have this tackled in a strategic document, but rather work um, and put a lot of efforts for that to be uh, implemented. Um, when, um, why is this important? Of course, because when young people are given access to communication technologies and social media, but are also given the specific skill set and knowledge on how to use them uh, for uh, achieving positive social change, I believe there can be many benefits uh, from it, especially in enabling young people to connect and communicate with like-minded individuals across borders, uh, creating global networks or activities, also providing a powerful platform for young people people to raise awareness about social and political issues. Um, they um, often use, of course, social media, online campaigns, digital uh, content to educate others, share stories, mobilize support for causes uh, they believe in. And there's the ability to reach a wide audience quickly uh, and engage them with the fa uh, facilitates the mobilization of collective action. And of course, um, I will add that the digital technology also enables young people to organize grassroots movements more effectively. They can use digital tools for event planning, fun raising coordination of larger activities um, thus by harnessing the power of digital technologies and information uh, revolution young people can overcome um, geographical institutional barriers mobilize collective action amplify their voices um, and bring attention to critical social issues uh, this opens the opportunity for establishing a platform for young activists to engage with wider audience, uh, build solidarity across borders, uh, and as I said, already achieve meaningful changes in the society. Um, one of the previous panelists also emphasized the impact of the disinformation on the political stability. So here I would like to uh, mention one good practices from, from my country, a successful initiative, uh, which is called uh, Truth Meter, uh, which started back in 2011. Uh, it's a website called truthmeter.mk, which is an, actually an initiative uh, led by Metamorphosis Foundation, which is one of our members in the member organization in the National Youth Council of Macedonia. And um, it is dedicated to fact checking and debunking false information and disinformation in the country, specifically analyzing the promises of the political subjects, presenting them in an easy to read and aggregated uh, form alongside systematic uh, statistical data. Uh, every identified promise is being um, assessed by the level of fulfillment, whether it is fulfilled, it's uh, unfulfilled, or it's maybe partially 
uh, fulfilled. Um, so I can say that this uh, initiative demonstrates the effectiveness of uh, fact checking in combating disinformation, uh, and it's a practice that highlights the significance of uh, transparency, collaboration, media literacy, and uh, engagement in promoting information integrity and combating disinformation effectively. Um, I know that we were short with time, so I'll just uh, stop here, but maybe if there is more uh, time later, uh, I can start to share still some uh, recommendations more. Uh, thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you. thank you so much, Marie, and thank you again for emphasizing the importance of leveraging the digital context also for positive outcomes. Not, not everything is, is negative, and I'm reminded of the movement, for instance, or Newman Hamas movement that uh, were powered uh, in part through social media and uh, resulted in much more impact than perhaps it would have been possible without this digital context. Right, so we have um, our last um, speaker is going to be uh, Zawad joining us from Bangladesh. Uh, and after that, we'll have some time to uh, discuss. Uh, Zawad, over to you. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor. So this is Jawad Alam from one of the most beautiful countries of South Asia named Bangladesh. So I am the uh, founder of Project We, and I've been working for a long time in fighting misinformation and disinformation. My previous panelists have uh, discussed more about like how we can actually leverage these digital technologies and they have given so many examples which can we can relate in our country as well. Like for example, in the political issue, it came in the religious issue. I, I, no, you know, I, I think you guys all know that how much sensitive we are yeah, regarding the religious issues. So in South Asia, we often see some misinformation and disinformation regarding the religious conflict and so on. But then there is also a good part that yes, you also are now taking initiatives. They are now doing much more things to actually combat this particular thing. And I would like to, uh, since many people have already discussed about so many initiatives and in, in Bangladesh, we have some initiatives from the youth organization. We have some initiatives from the Bangladesh government as well. But I would like to say two things about this particular issue. That is number one, behavioral change. And number two, digital literacy or social media etiquette. So in my, like in my last four year journey, I have been working with social media literacy and behavioral change because I believe that whenever people are actually growing up from the scenes, the very beginning of scenes of the childhood, sometimes they get the digital technology, but they don't know how to use it. So there is a very much gap between using and the digital literacy. So that's what we're actually working. And in my experience, I have been working on three different modules. Number one is the social media etiquette. Number two, how to combat and fight misinformation and disinformation. And thirdly, how to encounter if you are actually facing any kinds of cyberbullying. So in Bangladesh, we have seen that uh, the government has given a lot of support and they have already built a special zone for the human that so that if they face any kind of cyberbullying, because whenever sometimes we face these type of issues, we cannot actually express it properly. So we need a safe zone place where we can actually share all our things. So we, we can see that uh, the, the initiatives that, that have been taken from the youth and from the particular organization or government, we can, uh, we can actually learn one thing that is uh, if we can actually do it in a collaboratively way, in a collaborative manner, then we can actually fight all the uh, misinformation and disinformation. And I believe if we actually focus on the digital literacy, social media etiquette, then there will be a, a good change because sometimes what we focus morely is that how to prevent something. But why don't we actually uh, uh, like, why don't we actually focus more on mitigating the problem from the very root? So that's why I believe that behavioral change, social media literacy, it can be a good factor in kind of these things. And I'm, I'm so glad that already in Bangladesh, uh, there are more than 8,000 entrepreneurs who are been working on digital platform. And now they're actually ensuring that yes, digital literacy and also that these type of cyberbullying issues or misinformation or disinformation should be addressed. And the government is actually focusing on that. But yes, we can also formulate different type of policy because since I am a graduate on education, I believe that the cognitive skills, the psychomotor skills, an effective domain should focus on the students that yes whenever they are actually learning from the very school they should learn it from there in the textbook the curriculum there should be a curriculum reformation because in the past we are not uh, not so much into the digital literacy or ICT sector but now we are actually using it so social media literacy can be included in the curriculum and that's how the change is 
change will become. So that's all from my step from my side. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jawad. You're so right, and in fact, the importance of uh, drawing on insights from behavioral science was one of the main focus of the Nobel Summit over the last three days to understand better how to leverage and find points of intervention to change behavior precisely in the way you described it. So uh, we have uh, only a few minutes, unfortunately, for, for discussion. Um, let me first turn to the room here. If anyone wants to make a comment, please uh, occupy one of these two spots here. We have one more spot if anyone wants to make a comment. <clears throat> Very good. So we'll start here, please. Okay. Um, Maybe you. you can introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Linda Boyo. I am the founder of the Lawyers Hub. We work at the intersection of law and technology across Africa and based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I just, from the interventions, I think they were very useful in terms of looking at the balancing of platformizing, um, fact-checking, looking at, you know, the, um, the cross-movement across, you know, Global South and what's happening in Europe on AI Act and DSM. I thought those were really great uh, conversations. I think my comment will be, in terms of fighting disinformation, one thing that's really coming out is on local context, which we see is not being taken care of with big tech companies. I, I think there's been a lot of um, people voicing out and saying that we need more content moderators that are speaking lo local language mm -hmm. and that big tech companies need to invest in hiring more young people especially as content moderators to be able to fight this information on this platform so i think that's something that um, really needs to be followed up and then also to look at um, what then happens with um, uh, what investment can go into fact checking uh, because if they can invest in infrastructure, you know, there's um, a lot of in interventions now with the subsea cables and having people access data, um, especially for Africa. Mm -hmm. Why then not take similar resources and invest it in, in, in fact checking? Because we've seen the, the effects in the war in Ethiopia, for example, um, what disinformation and misinformation can do. But I just wanted to say that this was really great um, interventions, and I think. Um, one of the things that could happen is really across um, exchange uh, from the digital compact conversations. I think the policy brief this week by the UN Tech Envoy, one of the um, one of the submissions they made would be to have a global cooperation uh, because we are working in silos, and I, I don't think it helps in the end because there's people with talent, there's people with money, there's people with experience, but ideally we aren't really speaking to each other, and I think that would be useful, um, especially for the young people. Thank you. Absolutely, Linda, you're so right. And I think we fa face a, um, a challenge here in recognizing the diversity that uh, Giselle also emphasized and the point you made about diversity of languages, for instance. So how do we account for this diversity? And at the same time, how do we find a space for global cooperation where we somehow have to come together? So what's the, the right balance between these two forces that seemingly go in, in opposite directions? So I know Limon, but first we go into my... Uh, here on the left. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Fernanda from Open Knowledge Brazil. We are here because of the, the call uh, UNDP made with Digital Public Good Alliance. We made uh, open source technology to help to build a healthier ecosystem in Brazil. If anyone wants to know, I can give you a little flyer. So Pedro mentioned that technology is not the culprit, is how we use it. And I, I totally agree with that, but I would also add that is also how we build it, mm -hmm. how it's done. Because closed technology, I believe, is to blame. Closed architecture, opaque systems, mm -hmm. opaque infrastructures, um, they are an important part of the problem. So we really need to invest in open technology, in open source code, uh, in open infrastructures and open data as part of the solution. It matters. So we also need public uh, policy for that, regulation, legislation, uh, just how we are doing with personal data, we also need to do with uh, open infrastructure. We have, we have to stop being users and start being doers, makers of our own infrastructures. And this is so powerful. People and institutions can help build this technology and it can be replicated. 
we can optimize our investments, our resources. So this is just mm. the point I wanted to make. And thanks for UNDP and Digital Public Alliance for um, having this attention to this this question. It was uh, really uh, good to support this kind of initiative. Thank you so much, Fernanda. I'll look up and encourage everyone to look at Grido Diario. Yeah. And probably there's a website as well that you will yeah. be able to share. But I think the point you made is so important in emphasizing the, the role of public policy. So let me give you another example that's not so much on disinformation, but these, these fears or concerns that technology, particularly automation, including artificial intelligence, can replace people and destroy jobs. This is a matter of choice, really. And uh, it's something that can be influenced by policy choices, including uh, fiscal incentives, for instance, today it's much more expensive for a firm to hire a human than to invest in a machine because there are a number of, of tax obligations that come along with uh, hiring a person. So that is a choice. We can make a choice in which incentives are structured in a way that makes it much more uh, profitable for firms to actually hire humans and use machines to amplify what humans can do. So I think that is a very, very important point. Uh, Limon, over to you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, thank you to our youth for their insightful presentation. I'm Limon Rodriguez. I'm a doctoral candidate at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies or SAIS. My first um, intervention is more of a question, and second is, is comment. Um, first, after hearing from our speakers you know, on the role of, say, use of local language, in the role of education and skills, and uh, the role of technology you know, in uh, combating misinformation, dis disinformation. And this reminds me of what uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Maria Ressa um, keeps on you know, um, telling no? um, at various events. Lies laced with anger and hate spread faster than facts. But there's an antidote, inspiration. So my question is, I mean, for, you know, uh, our for people here working uh, at international organizations, what are like, the emerging priorities you know, for, for IOs, including the United, system, United Nations system, to deal with information pollution? And second, yeah, to the point on, uh, on technology, digital technology, I was wondering, you know, the rise of uh, GPT, you know, uh, Generative Artificial Intelligence AI, to what extent can we use that uh, technology you know, to, to, to deal with information pollution. And to your point, Pedro, on uh, you know the impact of, of automation. In fact, uh, I just uh, came across this study from Accenture, because I used to work for Accenture, um, that, for instance, they analyzed like, tasks uh, in a customer service job. And like they identified like 13 tasks you know, for a customer service agent. And they identified like there are some tasks which will be fully automated. There are some tasks which will be augmented by both humans and the machines, by computers. And there will be tasks which will be fully performed by humans. So the bottom line there is there are tasks or the, the, there will be tasks no, that, that will be um, impacted, adversely affected by, by automation. But there will also be um, tasks which uh, need no, um, the, the human component, which again goes back to the point of like skilling no, our our youth, no, our workforce, not uh, with skills that are in demand in the fourth industrial revolution. And I, I think you made a very important point in describing the impact of automation and artificial intelligence on tasks and not on occupations. Because sometimes there is this discourse that machines and AI are going to replace entire occupations. It's very hard to replace an occupation. In fact, in the US, if you look at the list of occupations that have been traditionally listed, in, in uh, surveys, the only occupation that was removed entirely since the 1950s was elevator operator. Mm -hmm. So that's an occupation that is gone. Mm -hmm. All the other occupations stay there, but of course they are re reconfigured, not only as a result of technology, but as a result of other economic and, and, and social changes. So let me invite the, the panelists to answer Limon's question and to comment on what Linda and Fernanda said or to comment on every whatever uh, anyone uh, has said. Let me see if anyone wants to come in. Luisa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. Um, I wanted to comment on something actually that you said <laughs> um, and just kind of, yeah, maybe bring some reflection on 
why or what are our priorities when we talk about information integrity? Um, because you said something about how um, we have to think of new ways in which companies can um, make profit using um, information and technology. And maybe I would like to take a step back and kind of think of what is our priority? You know, it's sometimes I feel like we have to choose profit or people. And I feel like most often companies choose profit. And so maybe our reflection would be to maybe decentralize profit as kind of the goal of the digital economy and think of ways in which we can you know, for example, reach um, socioeconomic uh, equality or provide more equal opportunities. And of course, you know, industry and profit is also part of that in our capitalist system. Um, but I think that it's really, I think we as, you know, decision makers or people with influence, we really have to speak up on, on the need to also look elsewhere. Um, so we just, I don't know, bringing some reflection, maybe that's not exactly what you meant, but I definitely thought it was important to raise this point. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. No, very much appreciated. And I fully agree and subscribe to what you just said. My point was much, it was simply to say the way in which incentives are now structured imply that firms increase their profits when they replace people with machines but this is not necessarily the way it needs to be. It's a choice. It's a policy choice that can be changed. Um, I thought I saw another hand. Was it Dania? No. Yes. 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 I go ahead. Say, yes. I will say we can make use of uh, IA to promote real information and get rid of misinformation in the people. Very good, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dixon, and then we go to Wani. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, just also to agree with uh, the, 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 as, uh, the statement regarding need for, I think, uh, us to invest more in uh, fact uh, checking uh, to combat misinformation. I think it's very important. Like I indicated earlier, the, the impact of misinformation is quite huge. In our case, uh, like I indicated earlier, you see that during the COVID pandemic, many people never got vaccinated because they believed the misinformation that was flying around uh, about uh, COVID not being real, uh, the vaccine being dangerous. So we lost many lives because people were not vaccinated. But secondly, where we are working from in the climate change space, I feel, I feel climate change is not taken that seriously. It's not given the importance, like in terms of allocating resources, partly because of the same misinformation and debate going around and skepticism that whether it really exists or not. So there's need to invest in fact checking. There's need to invest in, in tracking perpetrators and perhaps uh, imposing such sanctions uh, on, on them when they are, they are caught. Otherwise, I think the impact is, uh, uh, is really massive. Action has to, be, has to be taken. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dixon. Um, Wani, and then we'll go to uh, Alison. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Pedro, for giving me back this session. So I was still trying to stress on something about, uh, someone talked about the working on AI to, to really force the, like, uh, to force the, this uh, misinformation. You see, uh, when you look at the digital part of this, this part, I know the digit, as the digital technology grows, of course, it comes with a lot of uh, issues at the end of the day. But uh, leveraging the AI, like working and developing through research and working and developing an ethical AI development that can really foster like uh, to break down the misinformation could be really of a good help that you, uh, the UNDP and the researchers could actually look into and find a better way they can, they can work in, uh, in that way. And also sometimes also let's try to promote like data transparency and accessibility uh, for the uh, for the other part, like me, I took the case of our country as South Sudan. Uh, we have really the biggest problem in the world, I can say. Not saying because we have the biggest problem, but according to what I'm living in, 
we trying our best actually to also to live up to the world, but we trying to copy up at the end of the day. But if the you uh, the United Development uh, Program, they, if they can really work in hand with the local communities, the local like uh, people to engage in all these, this is going to be of a, of a better help to the community uh, in the play in the places. Then also maybe enhancing the international corporations that uh, could help. Uh, the people, the government, the governance, the building policies towards information, uh, and then the digital literacy of the of the people, of the media, and everything. This is what I could really put, like, emphasize that uh, you people should look into uh, in a very like uh, short period, like uh, time. This is what I could really emphasize here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wani, uh, Alison, and then uh, Santosh will have the last word. Yes, hi. As you said, guys, uh, this information spreads quickly, and sometimes uh, the human work to combat to combat this problem is uh, insufficient. Uh, and I am glad to, um, to know that uh, new tools are being generated uh, to help us generate response uh, as fast as this information. Uh, in this presentation, I have here several super interesting projects. And sometimes that I wanted uh, to, to say is um, the importance to do fact-checking in native language. I think uh, Dixon Matulula said uh, this too. Um, for example, uh, here in Peru, Ojo Público do fact-checking in native languages, such as Quechua and Shaninka. And this is important because we are exposed to uh, this information, and as you say, uh, Pedro, um, mm, the fact that we that people don't have access to social media, it doesn't mean that they don't they are invulnerable to this information. So we have to create uh, uh, tools, and we have to make efforts to do fact checking fact-checking in a uh, native language. I think this is so important and I wanted to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. And that also uh, emphasizes the point that Linda made about local languages. Um, uh, Santosh, final word. Thank Big you. responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're waiting for the solution from you. Okay. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, I second with all the suggestions provided, and I just want to refer just one point. That is, sooner or later, all the governments will be regulating this. Already, there is a voices for regulating it through the laws and policies, and uh, there is always a uh, chances that while regulating it is speech, disinformation, and misinformation. It's a kind of, uh, the policies are double-edged sword, and they are, that is going to have impact on the digital civic space, on civil society, on freedom of expression. So that policy making should be not a one-sided job done by the government and the powerful people, but it should be a multi-stakeholder process. And AI regulation is also uh, coming up. And recently in April, UNESCO had asked the member countries to have the uh, AI regulation guideline, uh, in-country guidelines. However, the discussion in country is, uh, uh, no, it's not there in global south. Uh, civil society are not, uh, do not have the kind of capacity to have the uh, right best approach or the assertion in this uh, process. So uh, I think uh, we have to make, uh, to support this process, we have to also support the civil society, bring them on board, build their capacity on uh, these policy processes. And it should be an open, transparent process where the governments in Global South or anywhere, they do not just regulate it through the laws and policies, but make it an open and transparent process where stakeholders discuss this and also the possible impacts. That should be done, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh. Unfortunately, we have to stop. I learned a lot and uh, enjoyed very much the, the discussion. I'm handing over to my colleague, Niamh, for a, a final, final word, but as I do, so I want to pay tribute to the Oslo Government Center's work uh, on, on this agenda that's been very important for UNDP, but more importantly for the world. Um, and link also to an initiative that was launched during the Nobel Summit uh, of an international panel on um, environment information. 
uh, that I think is going to be an important platform uh, to do something similar to the IPCC, the National Panel on Climate Change has done for climate, to collect the information um, that would enable policymakers, uh, civil society, businesses, and everyone else to, to make more informed uh, uh, choices uh, and take more informed decisions about what to do to combat this, uh, this challenge. So with this, leave over to you. And I'm stepping out. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure how many we still have left online. I hope you've been able to, to stay with us. Apologies, we, we went a little bit over. Um, I'm going to be really short. I'm going to just say three things. First of all, everything I heard today here is, is so inspiring. I admire all of you for the efforts that you're making to, to solve a problem that in many ways isn't yours and has been imposed upon you. I really encourage you to, to go back and watch day one of the Nobel uh, Prize Summit. It's on YouTube, I believe, and I, I think that will give you also some inspiration that you really are not alone. There is a huge global network and community that, that worries about this the same way that you do. Um, the second thing I want to say is that it is unacceptable that the burden of this problem is on you. Um, you know, we, we are once again passing to the next generation a, a, a huge, complex and, 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 and immediate crisis. Uh, in terms of the, the state of our current information ecosystem. So um, I, I, and this brings me to my, my, my third point, which is there is real power in networking and collaboration beyond borders on this issue. And I, I really want to encourage all of you um, and anyone on the, the, uh, at this meeting with interest in this issue and working on this issue and concerned about this issue is it, we, 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 the, the, the we will not make change without having really strong, unified messages to bring to those in power and to those who, who, who need to make the necessary changes. So I really encourage you to please continue to collaborate with your local UNDP offices if you're not doing so already. Go and knock on their doors, please. Um, come to us at the Oslo Governance Centre um, and, and other parts of UNDP. We have a really strong youth team that I think you're all connected with. And, and, and let's find those opportunities to take the, the learning that you have, the concerns that you have, you know, prioritize them and let's get them onto the international agenda and let's get them heard. So um, I offer that to you as, as um, a UNDP um, call to action. And I really wish you all well in these endeavors. And um, I hope that we can find ways to support you in them going forward. So thank you so much for taking the time and uh, wishing you all uh, best of luck. And um, to our audience, thank you for staying on a little bit beyond the, the time allocated and to everybody here. Thank you.